Hi, uh, my name is Paul. I'm going to be doing a discussion for our experimental um, conversations. I just want to quickly say, like, a lot of people seem to underestimate the amount of ocean we have, and they, they also undervalue our ocean ecosystems a lot, where basically, oceans give off half the oxygen, they absorb 50 times more times of um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They are about 90% of them are habitable places on planet. And about 50 to 80% are where species rely on oceans and live on oceans. But um, the reason why it's important to keep conserving our urban oceans and protect them is because as we know, we only establish, we only establish to know about 5% of the species in the ocean on the ground. The ocean, right? So if we're to using up ocean and stop protecting it, then we're basically losing all those potential species that can be studied and discovered. So I kind of feel that in a way where we're losing like innocent lives of people too in a different way. So um very graphical slide. This is uh basically our groups went into group of three. Each person responsible for a city and we're looking for interventions, recommendations, or um, some way, some strategies to conserve ocean, or, or, or an ocean. How far is our first group, second group, and third group? And there's currently everyone speaking in our groups about one specific recommendation that they got from their city or got from the whole group. So we think that uh, climate change is a global thing, so we think our solution also does the global. So we're looking at all this type of cities here on and uh, Andrew is going to be starting off stuff with uh, stormwater. Cool. So stormwater runoff has always been a major problem for most uh, sewer systems in all major cities. Uh, but what makes New York City unique is the city's combined sewage uh, infrastructure since it cannot handle the southern rush of water that comes as a result of storms. Uh, this results in combined sewer uh, sewage overflows in which raw sewage and trash combined with the stormwater flows into New York City's waterways and eventually the open ocean. Um, flooding of the city's vulnerable communities from stormwater overflow also compounds this problem. Uh, New York City has approved uh, proposals to address CSOs uh, in 2017, but it does not have a long-term solution for this problem. So to reduce CSO events, uh, we recommend that New York City implement cost-effective free roofs on all buildings. Many of the city's buildings are old and retain traditional infrastructure that have led to the stormwater runoff that is causing this issue. Uh, gray roofs uh, retain between 40 and 80% of rainwater and release water more slowly after each storm. This will help New York City prevent CSO events by decreasing the amount of water that enters the sewer system and reducing the pollution that is carried by the overflow. So with the onset of climate change, we're going to see a lot more of these storm events and a lot more of sea level rise. And our, one of our main lines of defenses against all this water that the ocean is throwing at us are seawalls. And usually when we think about seawalls, we think about the examples I put up here, we have on the left-hand side an uh, example from Tokyo, and on the right-hand side an uh, example from Jakarta. And what we can see here is that there's not much going on. Um, the seawalls have cut off access to the waterfront, and not only that, they have uh, damaged the marine habitat that you can't see underneath. So, next slide. when we think about how we're going to protect New York from flooding, we have to consider how we're going to make the how we're going to, how the seawalls will affect the waterfront and how we can use them to enhance our natural environment rather than detract from it. So one of the examples up here in the top right hand corner is from Shanghai. And what they did was just a really simple thing. They took the seawall and they just covered it with plants and flowers. And now it's called the lover's wall. Um, people go there for wedding photos, uh, influencers go there to take photos, um, and then draw a lot of foot traffic area it brings people to the waterfront where um, in an area that you know if it was just a concrete wall no one would ever go so taking that into account 
Um, over here we have a proposed uh, project from New York City, for New York City. Um, this is the area of uh, Brooklyn Heights, and this is this uh, highway you see underneath here is the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. And as we may all be familiar with, um, a lot of our waterfronts are cut off by these highways, right? And what this project proposes is uh, building a park over the highway. And not only do we get like in increased um, <laughs> Access to our waterfront and really bringing the city and the waterfront together, we also have this really nice grade, 50 feet of just built material for uh, flood defense. Um, okay, what? And what about ecological diversity? Obviously, that's also very important. That's something a normal seawall doesn't really take into account. Um, up here in this top left hand corner, we have an example from Sydney. Uh, this is a living seawall, and it's uh, essentially just like a hexagon. And it's 3D printed from bio, not bio, recycled plastics. And the structure is made to imitate mangrove roots. And what this does is it allows native, not, maybe not even native, but just marine life in general to attach to it. And kind of replaces a lot of some of the habitat that was lost. And again, bringing it back to New York City, this is a project that's being implemented in Staten Island. Um, these are called living breakwaters. And what's really cool about these is that they're built with many different types and shapes of materials, which creates little niches for little fish and various other different types of niches for other types of marine life. And as you can see, um, this also creates an area for human recreation, so humans can also directly enjoy the waterfront, while the breakwaters protect the uh, beaches from erosion and can reduce wave heights by about uh, four feet. So taking both of these, uh, proposals into account, we can create not just flood protection for sake of flood protection, but we can protect New York City and enhance the shoreline at the same time. So our next policy recommendation has to do with um, ecological restoration. And many, if not all of our cities, conservation and ecological restoration are important issues that need to be tackled. Many cities um, that we studied are on the coast and they're studied, they're settled near wetlands and um, for good reason. So the brackish water of wetlands um, are home to a diverse mix of fish, animals, and other organisms that can be hunted, caught, or eaten. Additionally, wetlands provide important ecological services like nutrient and contaminant absorption, as well as flood and stormwater retention. Um, however, despite these important services that wetlands produce, um, they're being lost at an alarming rate. So in New Orleans and Louisiana, 75 square kilometers of um, wetlands are being lost every year. And so in New Orleans in particular, one of the ways they are combating this is um, through a local co coalition called the Restore, Restore the Mississippi River Delta. Um, and they have created a project that will restore 30,000 acres of wetlands while providing jobs to the local community. So wetland degradation is definitely a global issue. Um, in Shanghai, some of the natural wetlands are being removed in favor of these things called nature parks, which are man-made landscapes that are meant to be visually appealing instead of um, environmentally sound. And then on the other hand, we have Sydney, um, and then the government has given out over $8 million in coastal and estuary restoration projects. So in terms of New York City, um, the city acknowledges this wetland degradation, um, which was reported in its plan NYC report in 2007. But while it briefly discussed how it will improve, how it will improve and increase the city's wetlands, um, it's not much has been discussed about who will be doing this. So our policy recommendation is that New York City, New York city should implement a um, wetland restoration training program. And so this program would train adults within communities situated um, in or around wetlands, such as Jamaica Bay, which these two images show right here, um, who are interested in learning about learning about wetlands and working in them. And so in order for this policy to be effective, it would require assistance from organizations that already focus on conservation work, like the New York City on Audubon and the Nature Conservancy that will provide training and mentorship to participants. So um, in order for this policy to be, so why would this policy be effective? Um, not only is it increasing the amount of participants working in wetland rest restoration, it also gives the participants a background in conservation and restoration that you can utilize for job experience. Um, having trained and experienced members of the community rallying for the wetlands in their community is a powerful and stable way to ensure the future of New York City's wetlands. 
Um, one of the major issues currently affecting New York City in terms of seafood is the mislabeling of fish. A recent report from the New York State Attorney General's office revealed that an estimated 42.65 of all fish in New York City supermarkets are mislabeled, with cheaper species being labeled as more expensive species, species shown for health reasons being sold as the preferred species, and um, environmentally harmful seafood options being passed off as more sustainable. Furthermore, a significant amount of fish being served in New York restaurants are mislabeled as wild, when in fact they are farm-raised. A recent study by Ocean discovered that an estimated 38% of salmon within restaurants are incorrectly labeled as wild. Thus, it becomes apparent that as a chain of custody lengthens, the lack of transparency forces. And to cultivate a better relationship with neighboring oceans, residents must become more aware of when and where they're seen caught. And so there are several ways NYC can combat this mislabeling of fish. First is New York City should encourage more residents to purchase from retailers at green markets. Uh, these are significantly more reliable and they often catch the fish themselves. Uh, this, was also, this would also strengthen the local economy as more residents would just show support for small businesses. Uh, second, the city could educate New Yorkers by spreading greater awareness of the rampant fish labeling currently going on in the city. Uh, we could show tips of how to combat fish mislabeling through kiosks, uh, such as being suspicious of overly cheap fish and fish being sold out of the season. Third, New York City uh, should work with neutral third party organizations that reward transparent restaurants with certifications that can bolster business profits. Uh, for example, restaurants in Seattle can voluntarily enroll in an organization known as Smart Cash that rewards certifications based on cash to plate transparency and sustainability. New York, City, New York City can work with a similar institution to implement such programs so that trustworthy restaurants can reap rewards for being honest with their produce. And finally, the city should hold WS retailers and restaurants more accountable by introducing more stringent regulation and higher fines to ensure less, less malpractice. And working with organizations in the industry that work to improve transparency among fish supply chains such as Okay, so plastic pollution is a widespread problem and you can even see it here in New York City. For example, this is some plastic debris that was collected at Jamaica Bay here in New York City. Um, when plastic enters the ocean, it has negative impacts on marine life since they frequently ingest it. Um, because plastic can only be recycled once or twice, recycling is not a very effective way to divert plastic from entering the trash or the landfills or our waterways. Um, so from Hanoi, we learned that, that legal loopholes can easily make taxes on plastic ineffective. Um, for this reason, we recommend a total ban on plastic rather than a tax. And to this end, we recommend switching most packaging to glass, metal, or paper. Um, since glass and metal can be continuously recycled, there is little new material being created, and paper can be recycled up to seven times and is naturally biodegradable. Um, and from Tokyo, uh, we have seen significant resistance to depart from plastic because many people and industries have come to depend on it. Um, in order to address the dual situation of plastic pollution and plastic dependence, many Japanese companies have begun exploring plastic alternatives. Similarly, we recognize New York City's own dependence on certain forms of plastic. Um, not all plastics can be replaced with metal, glass, or paper packaging. Uh, because of this, in certain cases, such as for film plastic, we recommend a 100% compostable bio-based plastic alternative. Um, and these would be disposed of in compost bins. And by not increasing the number of waste streams, the amount of work for both residents and waste management companies remains the same. Um, however, it would also be necessary to work with composting facilities to make sure that they are able to handle these products. Um, and then when plastic is recycled, it is frequently used to make polyester or other plastic fiber textiles. Unfortunately, this does not divert plastics from entering our waterways, but rather ensures it. Um, when clothes are made out of plastic fibers, and they're, when they're washed, they shed those fibers into the water. Um, so this graph here shows like um, how many fibers are released from different types of materials. Um, so acrylic would be the worst one, and then um, polyester. 
So to reduce this, we propose implementing a ban on the sale of clothing or textiles made from plastic fiber materials. However, because many residents purchase clothes and other textiles outside the city, we also recommend that the city distributes free um, guppy friends or core balls. And these are items that can help reduce the um, microfibers jumping into the water. Um, so the guppy friend, you just stick your clothes into it, and the core ball, you just stick into the machine. Um, and it doesn't have to be these items. Um, these are what's on like, the market right now. So there's more items become available. You can use different ones as well. Um, um, the guppy friend has been shown to reduce the number of microfibers that enter the water by 75 to 86%. And the core ball has shown a 25% reduction. Um, in addition, we recommend that the Department of Sanitation offers a curbside textile pickup service at least once every three months to help divert textiles from the, the regular trash. Um, uh, several cities, including Jakarta and Seattle, have already banned plastic items such as bags and straws. And by not only following in these cities' footsteps, but also going the extra one mile, we believe New York City can lead the world in a comprehensive divestment from plastics. Um, financing is a major factor in ocean conservation. Um, and in order to achieve a lot of these major goals and secure enough funding, there must be support from private companies and businesses since they play such a large role financially and environmentally for the city, consumers, and the ocean. Uh, for example, companies like Coca-Cola, Nestle, and Unilever contribute significantly to ocean plastic pollution and must be incentivized to implement more sustainable practices. Um, at the moment, there are many opportunities for tax credits and deductibles for people who invest in renewable energy. Um, for example, in many of our cities, including Honolulu and Seattle, businesses and individuals that use solar energy are given government-issued tax credits. Um, however, something that was missing from all of our cities were um, tax credits specifically for investing in ocean conservation. Um, so New York City must convince companies that investing in the ocean is a smart economic decision. Um, our policy recommendation is for the government to issue tax credits to businesses and individuals that invest in ocean conservation. Um, for example, companies can use alternatives for plastic packaging, um, invest in sustainable fishing technology and research, or collaborate with NGOs and government agencies through public-private partnerships. These tax credits would not only incentivize businesses to support ocean conservation, but also increase public awareness and education. Hey, hello. Um, I'm Jamie. Uh, <laughs> all right, so this is the, the, the real issue with a lot of these um, environmental problems and marine issues in New York is that people don't think of New York as like a, a harbor city or a coastal city the same way they view uh, cities like San Francisco uh, or Hong Kong. Uh, so the real issue is, is kind of informing people as to what's going on and also outreach in communities in the city. Uh, we recommend a couple practices um, for the, there's a lot of organizations already in New York who are doing these outreach events and also uh, restorative or conservation efforts such as uh, the Waterfront Alliance and the uh, Glow, or, sorry, Gotham Whale and Surf Rider, uh, several others like the Billion Oyster Project. Um, so there are already groups doing this work. We just want them to expand their scope and their scale. Uh, so our recommendations are there's three parts. One of them is government, partnering with government, uh, basically educational programs like the Harbor School in uh, Governor's Island is a marine science-based school. Well, not based, but it has a lot of marine science programs. Uh, and we suggest expanding those kinds of offerings to more people, because currently it's just the Harbor School in the whole city um, that is focused on marine science. Uh, and then there's also religious, uh, we, we suggest partnering with religious organizations. In Jakarta, it was really cool that, so during the plastic bag ban, like leading up to it, they were, they were garnering some support, and one of the strategies they used was they went to imams of Muslim uh, mosques in the area, and they told them about the issue, and they sort of discussed with the imams how to educate their congregation about the issue, and that ended up getting passed uh, so we could use similar strategies like partnering with rabbis or priests or imams 
in New York City to sort of educate people in a religious context, um, just get the word out. Uh, and then the third strategy was um, basically partnering with each other, because there's a lot of environmental groups and a lot of marine-based groups in New York City, and they do collaborate. But uh, we would like to see like larger scale collaborations. Like in uh, a lot of our cities, including Shanghai and Jakarta, they had like very, very large scale cleanup events. In Jakarta, they had one million people come out to a beach cleanup event, which is uh, yeah four percent of the population of the city. Uh, so if we could do something like that in New York, it would one raise awareness. Two, it would actually help. It would impact. You know, there would be a lot less trash out there. And then three, it would foster this. Uh, this new ethic of taking action for uh, marine conservation in the city, which we think would be very helpful moving forward. And then the fourth part was like creative projects focused on uh, online engagement, because there is not a lot of that right now. It's focused on New York. The first one we could do would be to increase the website infrastructure. I, doing the research for all of us was very difficult because there was not that many uh, there isn't like a hub for all the information you'd want regarding New York's waterways or oceans or rivers. Uh, so we would create that. We would recommend. We would also recommend the uh, like online campaigns. Here's a good example one that took place in Seattle called the Stop Sucking Campaign. It was about straws. Uh, yeah. So get your head out of the gutter. And it was. Uh, <laughs> about straws and it was, they're trying to ban plastic straws, they're trying to raise awareness and sort of garner public support in the city. They purchased commercials and there were like ads throughout the city, hashtag stop sucking, and there were like videos online that garnered like 500,000 views and such. So those kinds of campaigns would really help raise awareness and also they could garner public support for like you know, you know, marine conservation uh, legislation. So I'm um, spanning from the creation of a wetland restoration project to the implementation of complete plastic, plastic ban, we believe that the recommendations that we've shared with you today um, will not only combat but also help prevent the issues that New York City is currently facing. Um, drawing solutions from around the world, um, such as cities in cities of Jakarta, Shanghai, and Seattle, we hope to have given you a new perspective on, on the ways in which New York City can respond to today's most pressing climate issues. However, as, city, as sea levels continue to rise and global temperatures increase to projected warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2030, it is imperative that we as residents, business leaders, academics, policymakers, and most of all citizens of the earth, communicate and collaborate with each other to implement the long-lasting effective changes necessary to ensure the future of our planet. For a global problem, we need global solutions. Is there, is there any, I mean, of all the cities that, that you looked at, is there any, is there any sense of um, whose ocean or whose ocean front is, is like the worst or the best? It's like, is there some way of, to, of rating the cities based on their ocean quality? Which cities are doing the most in terms of conservation? Well, do they, or, no, or do they, do they, is there coordination among them so that they sort of know for themselves which, you know, which country has the best ocean area in which oh. country, or is it not happening like that? Well, I think in the cities that we did, um, we didn't really necessarily rank them. We kind of more looked at all of the similar policies, different policies, and then use that as a way, use that to like translate to New York. Um, but I do think if you were looking into a ranking system, I do know that there's the 100 resilient cities, and so there are cities that are trying to become more resilient in the face of climate change and other environmental issues, but I'm not sure if they rank them. Um, so, uh, as a board member of the Waterfront Alliance, I'm curious um, your thoughts on that civic entity here in New York and the equivalents you may have come across in the other cities that you study, and the prospects for that type of civic engagement and um, globally. Three questions. <laughs> Each person, one person. <laughs> Um, I think that the Waterfront Alliance and 
my city was Honolulu, and I couldn't find anything like, I know the Waterfront Alliance was the Harbor scorecard, um, and that was really helpful in my research for um, equity and access, because um, they rank like where the swim up, like how much of the water is swimmable and how much of it is safe by EPA standards, and I don't think that exists in a lot of cities. Um, so I think in that aspect, it's really helpful um, for the public to know how many, like how much of their water is actually like usable to them and helpful for the government as well to take action in that way. Yeah. Well, in terms of civic engagement, um, my city was New Orleans, and I thought it was really interesting um, that there was an architecture group that was working on this thing that New Orleans was putting together called the Great Urban Water Plan, which was their plan to um, because New Orleans, it's, it floods a lot, it gets a lot of rain, and then it's right next to the Mississippi River, and it's right next to the uh, Gulf of Mexico. So it gets a lot of water. And so they were creating a system so they wouldn't have to use the levees as much. And so that required, obviously, like private um, engagement as well as working with the, um, the government. And they also, because they have to implement it in this city, it requires a lot of input from the citizens there as well. So that was something I thought was really interesting. So I think this is a really interesting survey for us of all these different approaches that cities around the world are taking. And as you all know, I'm sure, and probably most of the people in this room at this point, we're all familiar with the Big U project, which was one of the major um, rebuild by design <coughs> strategies that you know was supposed to allow really innovative sustainability mechanism for Lower Manhattan. And we also know it turned from the Big U pretty rapidly into the Big Y. Or, um, because you know it was cut up, and there were a lot of policy constraints that prevented the vision, right, from becoming reality. And I'm just curious when we think of best practices from around the world, um, if there are some major kinds of contextual framing issues that matter when we think of you know what works in Jakarta. Um, are, are there some big takeaways for contextualizing them for New York City? I mean, I'm thinking in particular, of course, of financial constraints, but are there some other things that you all came up against in looking specifically at the challenge of doing these sorts of things in New York City? So, I can only talk specifically about Shanghai. But, so in Shanghai, in China in general, the government system is very top down. So, like, you know, someone above you says, do this, and you're, you're going to do that. So if the five-year plan says you gotta like uh, this part of the city has to increase their stormwater retention by like 50 percent, but you're going to do that. And um, in New York, obviously, it's not it's not quite the same. We have many levels of uh, different like uh, checks and balances, competing interests, and all that um, that make it a little bit more difficult um, compared to like cities like Shanghai or like any other city in China, really. Um, but um, it's still do. It's still do. Um, is there a sense of how strongly coastal cities respond to other coastal cities over their own governments or populations? Um, presumably, cities are beholden to their own governments and their own people. Um, but to what extent, your city, for example, how strongly is a given city informed in terms of, like, as far as ocean conservation goes, by what other cities are doing? Is there like a consortium? Is there like a network? Do they all go to some convention in like Singapore and like once a year? Well, I think it kind of depends on what aspect of um, urban okay. conservation. So, I mean, in terms of like the 100 resilient cities, like that, I think is a really great way for cities to kind of connect and become more resilient. In terms of other things like coastal restoration and stuff like that, I haven't been thinking anything about like actual collaboration between like New Orleans and other coastal cities and what they were doing with coastal restoration. Um, but I do think that that would be a great thing for cities to kind of implement more is to like not only be inspired by the issues that they're having, but also the other issues that other cities are having that they might come across or they haven't come across. Thank you guys.